I was going to tell that story that Pastor Matt told because that was probably one of the most stressful experiences of my life because shortly before uh, they had me preach, they actually had me and two other guys go up there and sing without music, without the congregation because they all spoke a different language, and I had to lead it. And I'm not a singer, so I was already sweating when I had to do that. So it's nice to be back, a little bit more preparation, a little bit more comfortable um, than that. But if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to Galatians chapter 5. That's where we're going to be today. Um, and while you're turning there, I just want to say thank you to everybody. Pastor Matt has already said it, but thank you everybody for your support and your prayers for us as we were preparing to go and as we were there and you know as we're on our way back. It really was such a great experience, and I'm so encouraged now that I'm back. And it's a very humbling experience to be with those brothers and sisters for a whole week. It, I, I tell them people, I can't even really put it into words how amazing it was. It really just blew my expectations out of the water. That's the only way I can describe it. Um, but something stuck out to me while I was down there that was very humbling, and that was how hungry the people were for God and His Word. I mean, one morning, I think it was Saturday morning at 5 a.m., the men got together and they had like two hours together. I mean, who, who does that on a Saturday morning at 5 a.m.? That was really special time. It was really special to me, and like I said, really humbling. And then also, I can't remember what day it was, Pastor Matt, but that day that y'all had like four classes in a row, it was like all morning and afternoon they taught and the same people just sat down and listened all day. And uh, it's just something to think about. It's really impacted me and I, I thought it was very interesting. Um, but anyway, I just want to say thank you to everybody and, and pray with me real quick as, before we open God's Word. Lord, I, I thank you for this day and I thank you for everybody here that you've brought us out of this place, Lord. I pray that you would you would help me now as I open your word to be faithful and to be true to your message, Lord. It would be your message and not mine, Lord. Because if it's my message, Lord, it's going to be a whole lot of foolishness, God. So I pray that your will would be done and be your message, Lord. And I pray that you would open up our hearts and our minds and our ears to you, Lord, this morning. And you would have your way with your people, Lord, this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So I want to cover a little bit of context before I hop into Galatians chapter 5. So as many, many of you know, Paul, the apostle, wrote Galatians, and he was writing to the churches in Galatia, of course. And the reason, I think, is best displayed in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 7. So I want to read that real quick. This is Paul speaking. He says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. So, in short, what was happening is the people at the churches of Galatia, they're starting to believe some false teachings by a group called the Judaizers, Judaizers, different ways of saying it. Those people have infiltrated the Christian community there, the churches there, and they're teaching that the Old Testament Levitical laws must still be followed in order you know, to obtain salvation and to be right with God. So Paul is writing to the churches at the Galatia to, he's really defending the doctrine of justification by faith alone, which many of us know about was prominent during the Protestant Reformation with, with people such as Martin Luther. So he's writing to these churches to say, hey, you know, the only way that you can be right with God, the only way that you can be justified before God is by faith in Christ alone and what he's done. There's no, no reason to add on this other nonsense and try to add on to what Christ has done. Christ alone is how we are justified before God. So today, I want to use Galatians chapter 5, and we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 15, and I want to talk about legalism. And legalism is something that I've been struggling with a, a lot in my life, and that's what the Judaizers, the Judaizers, that's what they were trying to implement on the believers in Galatia. So I want to talk about that today. So legalism as a Christian can be defined this way, as a system of rules and regulations for obtaining salvation and spiritual growth. So anything that you do on top of already believing in Christ and what he's done, anything you add on to that in order to be right with God or to grow in your relationship with him. So adding on to what Christ has done. So join me now in Galatians 5, 1 through 15. I want to read that, starting in verse 1. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, 
Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. In Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view, and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who would unsettle you would emasculate themselves. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you're not consumed by one another. So before I start breaking down the text and give you my three points, I want to I give a little test to help us better understand legalism and, and maybe help us understand if that's something that individually we might deal with. Um, so I'm going to give you five point, a little five-point test, you know, a little self-reflection and thinking about yourself. But before I do that, maybe when I'm done, or maybe right now, you don't consider yourself a legalist, somebody who has a very legalistic view of Christianity. So here's a quote that I think applies to you. Sinclair Ferguson, a Scottish theologian that many of, many of you know, he said, because of our sin, we are all legalists by nature. And he, he gave an example, and he gave the example of, you know, when you share the gospel with somebody, you don't go to your church, you go out and you share the gospel, and a lot of times you'll find that they'll respond with, man, I'm going to do better. I'm not going to lie like I've always done. I'm not going to keep cursing like I've always done. I'm going to do better. It's about me. I'm going to do better. That's the example he gave. It's not about Jesus or God, but it's about what I can do better. In another example, and I, I can vouch that this is a personal experience, sitting right over there listening to Pastor Matt in the past. Pastor Matt talking about any number of sins, you know, lying, lust, and different sins, stealing, different things, you know, anybody, any one of us might be going through, and you sit there and think, man, you know, I'm really going to stop cursing this week. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut that out. I'm going to do better. Or I'm going to stop stealing this week. I'm going to do it. That's legalism. That's, that's I'm going to do better. That's not trusting in Jesus or God to help you. That's saying, I'm going to do it. So here's the test. It's five, five points really quickly before we, get to, before we get into the text. Just self-examine. And this is just a list that I put together from my own personal experience and also from the Internet. So number one, a legalist will constantly beat themselves up. Number two, legalists don't have any joy. Number three, they feel like God's not happy unless they do everything exactly right. For example, you know, you wake up, you, you have your quiet time, and then you get into your day, and maybe, you know, you want to watch TV, but, you know, does God really want me to watch TV, or should I keep reading my Bible, or should I start fasting, or should I start praying? And then, oh, no, I watch TV. Is God not happy with me because I didn't do exactly what he wanted me to do? That's just an example. Number four, you look down on others. You say, well, at least I don't do that. You know, I keep all these commandments right, but they're over there doing that. I'm better than them. And number five, you may believe that unless you are good, you won't be saved. So these points are outside the Bible. So let's look at the passage now. And what I want to do is see how the Bible, I think, addresses legalism. And I want to make three points to do that. Number one, the joy of freedom in Christ. Number two, understanding freedom in Christ. And number three, living in the freedom found in Christ. So number one, the joy of freedom in Christ. And I want to read verse one again real quick. It says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Man, a few weeks ago, I was really struggling with all this legalism stuff. I was constantly, like I said, beating myself up about little things. And I was, I was at work one day, and I had my Bible with me. And I just... Pastor Matt, I, I was asking for help, and he was like, man, have you read Galatians? So I was reading through the Galatians, and I came to Galatians 5, verse 1, and it was like the weight of the world was removed off my shoulders. 
for freedom. So th- I've been feeling like I was a slave, like I was under bondage, like, man, God, this is hard. Like, I was weary, I was tired, I had no joy. But then I read this, it says, freedom. And in the end it says, not a yoke of slavery. You know, I'm sure most of you know what I'm talking about. I don't know if it's like a Greek myth or, or whatever, the Atlas guy that holds up the world, or the, I think it's the sky he's holding up. I felt like somebody had taken that off my back. That's what I felt like. That's the first thing I thought about when I when I read this verse. Um, and I think it all goes back to, you know, what did Jesus die for? And the answer is the forgiveness of sins. 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. We are no longer bound by the law, but forgiven through Christ. We're forgiven. And see, what I was trying to do is I was, I knew I was forgiven in the back of my head, but it was like, every time I would mess up, it was like, man, I've really let God down. He doesn't love me like like I want him to. You know, I've really let him down. But the truth is, every time I sin, I'm forgiven because I put my faith in Christ. So when God looks at me, he sees Christ's righteousness and not mine. Praise the Lord. So there's no reason to beat yourself up anymore because because of the forgiveness that Christ provides. So the joy comes from knowing that no matter how bad I mess up, I know that I'm forgiven and the law has no hold on me. And real quick, I want to point out in verse 1, he uses the words yoke of slavery. And I think that's great imagery to describe what I felt like I was going through and I'm sure many of you have probably gone through. He paints a negative picture of the law here to show that the burden of the power of the law compared to the freedom to Christ. He's not saying that the law is a totally horrible thing, but I think he's highlighting the freedom that Christ provides versus the demands of the law that none of us can keep perfectly and just are a burden on us. Interestingly enough, in Galatians 3.24, Paul speaks positively about the law. He said, he says the law is our guardian until Christ came. So the law isn't the big, bad, scary boogeyman. Um, in this in this passage, he calls it the yoke of slavery, so that's negative. But also, he calls it our guardian. And by calling it our guardian, he it means that the law showed us our sins in ourselves, and it escorted us to Christ. God used the law as a means to move us to Christ. So through Christ and His gospel, we can be free and have joy through our burden being removed, as we look at the law in a different light, not as bondage, but as our former guardian. So number two, understanding freedom in Christ. How does this freedom work? In verse two, Paul says, if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. He's speaking to those who trust in the law. If you accept circumcision, if you try to add on to what Christ has done, you're still trusting in the law. Your your full trust is not in Christ. You cannot have both. You must have faith in Christ or faith in the law. It reminds me of in the Gospels where it talks about how you cannot serve two masters. If you're still trusting in the law, you do not have your faith fully in Christ. Therefore, the payment he made for us on the cross doesn't apply to you. In verse 4, Paul even goes as far to say that you are severed from Christ, like a rope that's been cut. You're severed from Christ if you're still trusting in the law and trying to add on to what Christ has done. Now, I'm not saying that Obviously, that legalism means that you're, if you struggle with it, that you're not saved. I think we can be deceived as true Christians. The devil, ever since the beginning with Eve in the garden, has been trying to deceive us. But true, true Christians can stray and be sidetracked. But think about those who are not God's children, who really, you know, a bunch of these people go to church on Sunday, and they think they're in Christ, but they live this life where they're not really trusting in Christ. It's more about, did I do good today? Did I do good this week? And that determines if they're right or not with God. And that's some of the perverseness of legalism. In verse 3, Paul says, As a result of not being in Christ, those who are not in Christ, who are still under the law, are obligated to keep the whole law. And you might think, you know, okay, this might, this might be a, a legitimate option. You know, I can live under the law. If I keep it 100% right, 
you know, the wages of sin is death. So if I don't sin, no death, I can keep the law 100% right. But if you go back a little bit farther in Romans, you'll see in Romans 3.23 that we've all sinned. So living under the law really is not an option. It's, it's not an option at all unless, unless you don't want to be united with, with God in heaven one day. So all this to say, if you want to be a legalist, that's fine, but you've got to keep the law 100% right, and, and that's impossible. So now, moving on to, I want to look at verse 6, where Paul says, Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. I think this is the most important, important part of the text. This is going back to what I talked about earlier, justification through faith alone. Only faith. Trusting in the law isn't true faith. It's faith, but it's more faith in yourself. Like You're trusting in yourself to keep it 100% right. Which is very prideful and ironically sinful. And one day standing before God, you don't want to be, Pastor Matt talks about this a lot, you don't want to be holding your own works in your hands because those aren't going to mean anything. Isaiah 64, 6 says our righteousness is like filthy rags. You don't want to be holding your righteousness, your good works, when you stand before the holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. Legalism is a dead end. We all sin, so trying to keep the law perfectly is not only very prideful, but it's also futile. If you look at it this way, faith is the only option. Freedom is in faith. Throwing, throwing yourself fully on what Christ has done because you realize there is no other, other thing that you can do. There's no way you can add on. There's no way you can help. All you can do is throw yourself on Him. So number three, living in light of the freedom in Christ. And I think this is important to remember. In verse 8 he says, This persuasion is not from him who calls you. If you ever struggle with legalism, you'll probably likely come to the conclusion the reason you feel the way you feel is because God wants you to be this way. He wants you to do these things. He wants you to you know, beat yourself up, up and really really do good. Like, be good. Like, oh, I can do better. But this is just another deceptive, deceptive tactic of the devil. The devil wants you to go down a rabbit hole of deception to distract you from the life that God has called us to through Christ Jesus. In my own experience, my feelings betrayed me. I thought that since I felt a certain way, that meant that God was placing that feeling on me. And I needed to carry it out. And I did be hard and legalistic on myself and those around me, my family. I thought, how could I be wrong if I was trying to keep His commandments? I thought I was doing God's work. But my failure was, I trusted my feelings and I, didn't, I did not check the Scriptures like I was supposed to. And I think this passage is very clear that the yoke of slavery is not from God. In verse, in verse 1, freedom is from God. Also, as we move forward and we walk in this freedom, there's a warning for those. In verse 10, it says, the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty. This is a warning for those who would try to distract somebody else. Those who promote unnecessary burdens and requirements will be judged by God. And today's Father's Day, and I just think about you know the father being the head of the family. That's a serious task. That's a serious responsibility. And the father is supposed to lead their families in the Lord. It can be very easily, easily easy to pull your family into legalism. So you got you have to watch yourself. Those who mislead not only God's children. For those who are not as children, I think Christians get a bad rap because of because of legalism. There's a lot of legalistic churches, legalistic people, you know, and that's why a lot of people are uncomfortable going to church. You know, you got to wear this, you got to look a certain way, you got to do this, this, and this to be a part of us, and it gives the rest of us a bad name. I think there's only one gospel: faith in Christ. As you, as soon as you start on, adding on to that, you have changed the gospel and are putting an, an unnecessary constraint on those who believe and would believe. Also, as you move forward in the freedom that Christ offers, you've got to be ready to offend some people. In, in verse 11, Paul talks about the offense of the cross. And we always talk about it in church. But what, what is he really talking about? The offense of the cross is telling somebody that they cannot earn salvation. What's more offensive than telling somebody they can't do something? You know, when you tell somebody they can't do something, they're going to be like, who are you to tell me that I can't do something? 
Who are you to tell me I can't be right with God? That's, that's how we are by our nature. We, we think we can do everything by ourselves and we don't need anybody's help. So you're going to offend some people if you talk about the freedom that Christ provides. It's just throwing ourselves on Him and trusting Him. Now, I think this is the most impo- important part of the passage as we draw to, to verse 13. Paul says, Do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. So this whole time, we've talked about faith and faith alone. And that is true. But I think there's, there's a spectrum. We've been talking about legalism. We're talking about faith alone. I think legalism's on one end of the spectrum. And the other end of the extreme, it, it's sort of this over-reliance on faith. You know, a lot of people go to church week in and week out, and they agree in their head, like, I, I, yeah, that's true. Jesus, yeah, that's true. I, I, I agree with that. But is their faith really, really in that? And I think, trying to explain it, an over-reliance on faith. I don't think this is true faith. You're just showing up at church and thinking, yeah, I believe that, but it's not affecting your life. True faith is supposed to transform your life. We are free, but we still have to be, be careful. Don't take, don't take this freedom and waste your life serving yourself, your desires, and your pleasures. God calls us to much more. He calls us to a personal relationship with Him at the center of our lives. So don't go on living how you want to live and claiming you have faith. True faith produces good fruit, Matthew 7, 15-20. And examine yourself, like it says in 2 Corinthians 13:5. Don't stake your soul and eternity on a thing that you call faith. A faith that only thinks about Jesus on Sunday mornings when you reluctantly go to church. A faith that pushes God to the bottom of the to-do list. Man, I'm going to have that quiet time with God tonight. I don't really feel like it though, so I'll just do it tomorrow. A faith that looks a faith that looks good on the outside, but on the inside you don't really care too much about that Jewish fellow who died on the tree. So there is, there is danger. There's, there's definitely danger in being legalistic and trying to follow God wholeheartedly and, and taking it to an extreme. But there's also uh, danger in just being like, yeah, I believe in God. Yeah. All right. So I think as we move forward, we should pray for God's wisdom and self-control and living in the freedom that he has given us through Christ. Without this help, we're really going to blow it because we're going to go in one ditch, which is legalism, or the other ditch, which is overemphasis on Christian freedom. In verse 13, Paul says, but through love, serve one another. It's like I just said a moment ago, not for your own pleasure and satisfaction, but loving one another. That's what we should do with this freedom. Use this freedom for God through loving and serving those around you. And in closing, there are somewhere around... This was shocking to see, and I just quickly on the internet I searched it up. There's somewhere around a thousand commandments in the New Testament. Um, that's impossible to keep all those 100% right every day. And if you're if you're going to live, you're going to live a very miserable life if your joy and your security depends on how well you keep all a thousand of those every day. You can't even remember that many. You're going to live a miserable life if that's the case, and that's what legalism promises. Christ purchased our freedom on the cross. He faced God's wrath on the cross, died, and rose again for this freedom. Freedom lies in forgiveness and our inability to earn it. He has done all the work. All we can do, like I said earlier, is cast ourselves on Him, throw ourselves on Him, and trust Him. And that's where true freedom lies. He offers not only freedom from sin and death and God's wrath, but most importantly, also from legalism and the law, which is what we talked about today. So as we move forward, let's all live in this freedom. And don't think you're doing God a solid by beating yourself and and being legalistic about everything. It's actually the opposite. You're dishonoring the perfect work of Christ. I'll say it one more time. Cast yourself on Him. Trust Him completely. There's nothing you can do to earn anything. All you can do is cast yourself and put your faith in what Jesus has done. That's, That's your role. Don't try to do God's part. That's all you can do. So let's pray. God, thank you again for this time that we get to all come together, Lord. Thank you for your word, Lord. You've provided to us, Lord, to lead us and to guide us. 
God, I pray that as we leave this place, Lord, that you would help us to fully trust the perfect work of Christ and not try to do things on our own, Lord. Because that, that's our nature, Lord, try to handle everything on our own. Help us to fully trust this sacrifice and what it's purchased for us, Lord. But God, help us. We're still required to live for you in all that we do, Lord, to develop a personal relationship with you, God, to help us not to abuse that freedom either, Lord. God, I thank you for this time, Lord, and I pray that your word that has been read, you would just have your way with this, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.